The Lord be with you. Well, this morning, uh, the text for my sermon will be from 1 John chapter 4. You'll see it there on the screen. I'm uh, deviating from the lectionary over these next three weeks. As you all probably know by now, these are my last three Sundays with you. And I want over these uh, three Sundays not to say anything new, but to say to you what I've always said to you. And that is that God is love. God loves you. There's nothing you can do about it. And so what are we going to do about that? And so today I want to start with that simplest, most foundational, uh, most simplest. That's not great. Can we scratch that from the recording? That's not great English. Oh, this is live now. We don't get to do it over and over. But um, that foundational truth of God as love. And so I, I thought about those things as I thought about what I might sort of leave with you as, as we prepare for this next step together. And uh, I, I read this passage in 1 John chapter 4. It's a, a passage of scripture that if, if there were a, I don't know, a stained glass window in my mind, it would be etched across the bottom uh, there for scripture. 1 John chapter 4, uh, beginning in verse 7. Beloved, let us love one another, because love is from God. Everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, for God is love. God's love was revealed among us in this way. God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Beloved, since God loved us so much, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God lives in us and his love is perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and do testify that the father has sent his son as the savior of the world. God abides in those who confess that Jesus is the son of God and they abide in God. So we have known and believe the love that God has for us. God is love and those who abide in love abide in God and God abides in them. Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness on the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment. And whoever fears has not preached perfection in love, has not reached perfection in love. We love because he first loved us. Those who say, I love God and hate their brothers or sisters are liars. For those who do not love a brother or sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. The commandment we have from him is this. Those who love God must also love their brothers and sisters. May God bless the reading and hearing of Holy Scripture. Would you pray with me? Eternal God. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. As we are so thankful to be back in this place, if only in a different way, to come to worship, we realize, Lord, around us, all around us in our country, around the world, things seem to be upside down, inside out, spinning perhaps out of control. So God, we pray for your Spirit's presence in your people, your Spirit's presence in the world, Lord, that we may bring peace, that we may bring hope, and above all, we may bring love. So now, Lord, as we lean in a little to listen to Scripture, we pray for ears to hear, eyes to see, hearts open and willing to receive what you have for us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. So, God is love. I don't know if there is a more definitive statement in the entire Bible. 
It's plain. It's there. It's without nuance. God is love. But when I first became a Christian, that was not the image of God that I would have said I had. In fact, before I was ever a Christian, as most of you know, I I came to faith relatively late for this part of the world. I was 18 when I became a Christian. And the image of God I had was, was one, as I told the folks earlier, sort of like my dad, but cleaner. Like long white beard, uh, probably sat on a throne, uh, was casting... Ju- and, and his only project, his only thing in the entire span of the cosmos was to look down on this little blue marble and make sure I wasn't doing anything bad. And then if I was, he'd write it down, maybe on a little pad, set it over to the side, just waiting for me to do something wrong, to either make my life miserable or to send me to this really bad place that we can't, we can't say because there are children present, right? And then when I became a Christian, that image, quite frankly, didn't change a whole lot. It was the same God, a uh, God, uh, a white guy with a white beard sitting on a throne in a white robe, watching all of us down here, making sure that we didn't do anything wrong, and if we did, to punish us, except now there was a footnote. <clears throat> now there was an escape clause in the whole thing. Now, if I prayed a prayer, uh, got baptized, whatever, became a Christian, then all that other stuff would still happen, except... When I die, I got to go to heaven. That was the image that I had of a God who was still judging, still counting my my transgressions against me. But now there was a way out. Now there was a back door to get around all that. But it didn't settle with me. I didn't like it. It didn't didn't fit uh, for some reason. Let's call it the spirit. It didn't fit. And so I, I did... What my pastor said to do, what my Sunday school teacher said to do, what all the people that others looked up to in the church said to do, and I read my Bible. Now granted it was a King James Bible, uh, a red letter King James Bible, but I read it. I read it so much the gold uh, uh, leaf started to come off from around the pages. The binding was beginning to peel down the side. And I, uh, contrary to what some people told me, I wrote all in my Bible. There's thick yellow highlighter that bleeds through several pages, notes out to the side, big question marks. What does this mean? Finding the center references, going to other places in the Bible. How do these two connect? Why did they even think these things connected and mattered? And I read my Bible over and over, and that image I had of God began to shape, or began to change. It began to melt away a little bit. And then I sought the counsel of people who I knew were far wiser than me, who had not only just read the Bible over coffee or in a Sunday school class, but had written dissertations about it, people who had gone to study it. And then I myself went to study it with people who had written dissertations about it and were asking me to write papers about it. I studied it more and more and more, and I still do. It's the reason I I didn't just stop it at college or at seminary, but wanted to, uh, to get a doctorate because I wanted to know more and more and more. And friends, I have to tell you, that image I used to have of God, can I be honest, it's not in the Bible. The definitive thing in the Bible, God is love. There is no, there's no sanding off the edges to that. It's plain, it's right there. It's here in 1 John. In fact, if you were to peel the English back off of this passage and try to read it in the Koine, the word love is everywhere. And not just like like brotherly love, not just fist bump you while I got my mask on kind of love, but like the agape, the unconditional that like you might be laying in the bed with COVID, but I love you so much kind of love. It's everywhere. God is love. But the thing that gets me, the thing that really, I think, seals the deal on the passage is not just this definitive statement, God is love and you figure out the rest. The writer says, God is love and we love because God first loved us. You've heard that before, right? We love because he first loved us. Have you ever thought about what that really means? 
Here's what I want you to do. I did this. If, if you were here in the nine o'clock, you don't you can think of a different one. Um, but here's what I want you to do. I, I want you to take just a minute to think about the worst thing you've ever done. And I'm not talking about, you know, you stole the Snickers at Yale's. I'm talking about the worst thing. Maybe maybe the person sitting next to you doesn't even know about it. Or maybe maybe you're thinking right now, everybody in this room knows about it. How don't you think about that? Think about how you felt. Did you love yourself? Oh, God, this is awful. I, I can't stand to even look at myself in the mirror. If it was one of those things that kind of gets out, how, how people look at you when you walk by, you think, oh, gosh, nobody cares about me. Nobody loves me. God did. God still does. It could have been years ago. It could have been before you were a Christian. It could have been while you were sitting in Sunday school. God loves you. And you love because God first loved you. It didn't start with you. It starts with God. Or think about, think about anything in your life when you felt unlovable, when you felt untouchable, unreachable, when people held you at arm's length, not because of a virus, but because of maybe what they thought about you. God loved you. We love because God first loved us. And I think, I think that's an easy step to take, if we're honest, right? Like, that's easy. I mean, it's a little hard to think about all the bad things we've ever done, to think about any bad thing we've ever done, and to imagine that God loves us. But we can get there. But the place that's hard, the harder step, I think, for us to take is not that God loves me, but that God loves everybody. That we love because God first loved all of us. That's kind of hard, isn't it? Why is it hard? Why is it hard to go from God loves me, right? Jesus loves me, this I know. Why? For the Bible tells me so. We sing that song. I don't think we sing a children's song, but God loves everybody, this I know. It doesn't rhyme, but you know. Why is that such a hard step for us? Because I think, and the writer of this epistle gets to it, I think it's because we're afraid. I mean, think about it. If, if God loves everybody, everybody, well, that means the people uh, who I don't think deserve it, right? That means if God loves me, I can get behind that because let's be honest, I'm a pretty good person, right? I've worked pretty hard my whole life. I've kept my nose clean. Uh, never been, I've never gotten a ticket. I've gotten some warnings. Um, I, you know, I don't, you know, I don't drink, smoke, dip or chew or run around with folk. Well, that's not true. Um, but, but I'm a pretty good person, right? But I know some people who aren't. I know some people with malicious intent in their hearts. I've watched the news. You have too. It doesn't matter what side you take on anything. When you watch it, you can go, those people right there on that side, those people doing that thing. But then the Bible tells me, well, you know, God loves them too. God loves those people who don't think like you, who don't look like you, who don't talk like you, who don't believe like you. And I'm afraid of that. Because if we're all the same, right, then I'm not special. Then I'm not as, as good as I, I think I am. That's hard for us to do because we're afraid. But the writer says God has given us perfect love. And what does perfect love do? It casts out all fear. All of it. That fear of being grouped in with somebody that they ain't like us. They ain't like us. That fear of I'm, not, I'm a little bit better than they are. That perfect love of God cast it out. It's not there. Now, does that happen in an instant? No. It still works on us. It still moves in us. This last weekend, I'm driving down the road. A black man starts walking towards my car, shouting, hands up, don't shoot. Do you think my blood pressure didn't go up a little bit? I know. 
I know he has every right to say that. I know what's going on in the world. I know how things are. And I know I have nothing to do with whatever he is saying. But that fear of, man, what? Yeah, I'm still, I'm still afraid. I'm still afraid sometimes, and I can tell you this, that I might not have it right. I'm afraid sometimes that there are things I might have wrong. And that, that keeps me up sometimes. But then the scripture comes. God is love. We love because he first loved us. And that perfect love casts out all fear. It's there. God initiates it, not me. God does. We love because God first loved us. All of us. Even those people who, 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 who have shunned God, who say, I've had enough of this God, of this religion business. It has done nothing to benefit me. My life has just gone downhill ever since. Guess what? God is still there. God still loves. Even if you've been in that place in your own life, throw the Bible in the trash, flip off the heavens, want to cuss at God, all these things seem to be falling apart in your life. You don't want anything to do with God anymore. And as hard as it is to hear, as hard as it is to understand, God is still there loving. Because there is no more definitive statement in all of Scripture than God is love. And those early images I had of God when I became a Christian. You understand that word Christian? A, a follower of Christ. When I became a Christian, there was not a whole lot of Christ in my image of God. Not a lot of Jesus in my theology. But to read Jesus, to take that old King James Bible, it was a red letter edition, and read those red letters of Jesus over and over and over again, it all came back to that same place. Love. That God is love. And here is what it looks like to uphold the oppressed, to, to welcome the stranger, to love to the point of laying down your life. Because that's what the cross is. It's not a transaction. It's not a trick. It's not, it's not a bargain. It's the God who created the universe saying, I love you enough that I'll die to prove it. Because in the end, God is love. And in the end, the ultimate truth, the truth I hope is not new to you, because my goodness, if it is after seven and a half years, I should just quit everything. The truth upon which all other truth is built is that God loves you. That God is love. And if you find yourself trying to pick that apart, if you find yourself trying to say, well, well, love doesn't look like this, you know what it looks like. You know down deep in your heart what it really means to love someone. What it means for God to love you. And the only reason we try to pick it apart is fear. But that perfect love cast it out. I'm not there yet. I kind of doubt you are too. But I'm trying. And I pray every day to be a little bit closer to that perfection. To be a little bit more and more like Jesus. Like God. Who is love. Who loved us before we first loved him. Whose perfect love cast out all fear. That ultimate truth. That God loves you. Would you pray with me? Now, God, we, we pray that we take the truth of your love, the definitive example of who you are. We take it and it shapes us, changes us, convicts us, comforts us, calls us. Lord, help us to be more and more like you, to continue to perfect love in our own lives until... Fear is gone, and all that remains is your perfect love. 
Be with us, Holy Spirit. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.